Annabelle has been doing video recordings of messages for several weeks now. Those are getting posted to YouTube. You can get there from our church webpage directly. Micaiah has decided to take upon himself to get the uh, church YouTube channel looking a proper and appropriate. And so he's been editing all of the surrounding content and making sure we have the right banners and symbols and content filled in, descriptions, and things of the sort. So he's been working and refining that, we made a lot of headway over the last week. If you see any room for improvement, let me know. The YouTube videos are somewhat new to me. But fortunately, my 14-year-old, they're an old hat to him, and he watches tutorials to figure out how to do all this stuff. So, this Sunday, we'll look at a common phrase from the New Testament. Love one another. You look up. Why is it they say one another? Actually, it's used in English to refer to groups larger than three, usually. If it's just two or three, then you say love each other. But when it's a larger group, say love one another. That means that everybody owes everyone in the group the same thing. There's no hierarchy and there's no priority to or toward one person. One of the things I like about that is it's not exclusive. It's a, it doesn't say love those who think like you, love those who talk like you, love those who are just like you. No, you have to love with the people that aren't like you. Love the people that don't agree with you. Sometimes they disagree with you mentally, but sometimes they just don't agree with you. A rather disagreeable person. To love those who don't get along with us. So it rises in the New Testament to the Last Supper conversation Jesus has with his disciples. John wrote his gospel, last of the four gospels, quite a few decades had elapsed. Matthew, Mark, and Luke get roughly the same story. And John fills in a lot of gaps. John's gospel is incredibly unique. And when it comes to the night of the Last Supper, he remembered an awful lot of things that Jesus said that he felt needed to be put to paper that the other guys didn't put down. Now, Mark and Luke, you could excuse because they weren't <laughs> there present. Matthew was there. He has a lot of unique stuff, too. But the things that stood out to Matthew to write down from the Last Supper did not stand out as much to John, and there's a whole lot of things that John wanted to fill in. But this is one of those things, this commandment that Jesus gives the night before he's crucified. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now think about the context of society that Jesus was giving them this command. See, Pharisees, they loved Pharisees. They didn't love tax collectors, they didn't love sinners, they didn't love prostitutes, and they didn't love Sadducees especially. Sadducees, they loved other Sadducees, but they didn't love Pharisees. In fact, there was an awful lot of hate between Sadducees and Pharisees. And the society in his day was somewhat divided up, parceled up into various different identity groups. Sound familiar? You know, Jesus didn't say just love those who are in your little group the way you like to be. He said to love one another. One of the fascinating things about the church is how it so quickly started accumulating people that were very different. Within the first year, Samaritans were part of the church. Talk about a stretch. All of a sudden, Peter and John go down to Samaria. They're looking at Philip's work, and they're like, yep, yeah, that's a lot of believing Samaritans. 
that command to love one another all of a sudden extends to Samaritans. They do like everything wrong. Like they completely misunderstood how to worship God from the Old Testament. It was just the source of all kinds of controversy. Wars were broke, breaking out before Jesus' time about that. Now all of a sudden Samaritans believe in Jesus. And then it's not too much longer and a Roman centurion believes. They're like the enemy. They're the one the Messiah was supposed to deliver us from. And now all of a sudden he's one of us. Dear Lord, we have to love Roman centurions now too? And then up in Antioch, more people start believing. Not just the Greek proselytes to Judaism, but like the Greeks who weren't Jewish follower people. Like just straight Greeks. Like, it's just weird. Now we have to love them too? And well, maybe we can just make them like us. And so then there's this huge group of Judaizers who are like, all right, so you got to be circumcised, you got to follow the law, you gotta, we got to make you like an Old Testament Jew for you to be a good Christian because all the rest of us are Old Testament Jews and so obviously you need to become one too. You know how Paul responded to that? He like throws the gates wide open. Let the Greeks be Greeks and let them follow Jesus and we'll teach them to love one another too. Well, that was a divisive thing. All of a sudden, the gospel is just including all of these peoples. And Paul even got to the Greeks. He wrote them letters and said, Now there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, Greek or Scythian. We don't think about Scythians too much. Scythians, they're the barbarians from the north that do crazy things. Like they don't even live in cities. They live in nomadic lifestyle in the grasslands of Ukraine. What's Ukraine now? And they're horse lords. And how do you even like interact with people that don't have a house? They just move around. Paul is even stretching the Greeks. In some translations, they don't even use the word Scythian. They just use the word barbarian because it was a synonym called somebody a Scythian, you're essentially calling them an uncivilized barbarian. This is such a dramatic command to love one another even when that other is not like us. Do you know this comes across twice in the same evening? I oftentimes have to tell my children several or the same thing several times. Jesus had the same issue. Same night, same idea. Just a little while later, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And he makes this very clear. He's not talking in terms of the Greek brotherly love that we like to have with people. He's talking in the terms of the self-sacrificial, agape love, where there is absolutely nothing you expect from the other. It is all on you to show them sacrificial love. This is unconditional love. They don't have to earn it. They don't have to add up to it. They just have to be. It's love that requires something from us. Not just warm fuzzies, thoughts and prayers and friendlies. It's sacrificial. It requires time. It requires energy. Sometimes it requires us to just sit there and listen. Actively, not just passively taking things in. Be like, uh-huh, yeah, mm-hmm. As a parent, I have to make sure that I don't step into that mode. Because I have seven people in my household who need my emotional affirmation on a regular daily basis. And they have things they want to share with me because I have a certain role in their household, in their life, that they need me to fill and no one else can fill it. And I find that oftentimes this means that I have to just simply be present, disengaged mentally from all the other concerns and cares I have in my life, and listen in a heartfelt manner so I can empathize and sympathize with what they are saying all the woes 
and I have to be sensitive to whether they really want me to solve their challenge or if they just want me to empathize with them in the midst of their challenge. And it costs me something. It doesn't just come for nothing. It's not the disengaged, passive, I'm kind of here, but I'm not really here. I'm just on autopilot and my mind is somewhere else. This isn't mindless love. It's a love that sometimes hurts. It costs us time, costs us money. You know, this is a conversation Jesus had with his disciples that really stood out to John. Some 60 years later, he's writing about this, not just in his gospel, but also in the letter that he wrote to the churches. He says, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. This goes back to the beginning of the church, John is saying, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was, a, the, was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. This goes all the way back to the beginning of human interaction. And we see, because of the evil one and the corrupt nature of humanity, we have things like envy and hate creep into our lives. And instead of seeing those around us as brothers and sisters, we see them as someone who is not like us. Someone who's a threat. Cain was threatened by Abel. Abel was accepted. And Cain's first sacrifice wasn't accepted. God gave him a chance for a redo how many redos do we get from God that we just burn up, like Cain burned his up? He went the exact opposite way. And he killed his brother Abel. Murdered him. First murder recorded in the scriptures. It's about 128, 129 years after the creation, based on when Seth, the brother who replaced Abel, was born. It's quite a long time. You know, we don't look fondly on murder in our society today. That's a good thing. We don't like taking the life of another person as a rule of thumb. We make some exceptions. But you know, Jesus talked about murder a little broader than just taking the life of someone else. That obviously is the ultimate way to show hate. But Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, if someone hates his brother, He's already committed murder in his heart. How many times does our inner thought life about another person run like a political attack ad? See those an awful lot these days on YouTube. They are like are in between every single video. My children are starting to know the candidates for election better than me because they are trying to listen to music videos on YouTube and somebody else's ad comes up and somebody else's ad comes up and they now have priorities and preferences and they like candidates over other candidates just based on their attack ads and things of that sort. I'm like, I have to start talking to you and get some opinions. What are they saying about each other even? But how many times do we let our minds run like a political attack ad about one of our friends, one of our neighbors, or more often even perhaps one of our family members? Extraordinarily one-sided, absolutely nothing gracious or understanding about it. No accommodation, no circumstances that would maybe explain their words or their actions a touch better. You know, they yelled at me and they were really sharp with their voice. Not going to mention that their leg was in a bear trap at the moment. They're in a fair measure of pain. You know, we just completely ignore the circumstances of another person. Oh, they just never say anything nice. They're always growling with me. Sometimes we tear people down with our words. These days it's become really in vogue to just call people names, reduce them to some identity. 
Sometimes we just disassociate with them entirely. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to anybody who sounds like them. Surround ourselves with people that sound like us and talk like us. John says we should not be like Cain. Which means that not only do we not murder physically, which I think all of us are pretty good with, but we also don't murder people in our hearts or in our minds. Instead, think of them as a brother or sister, family. John continues. He says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death, and who, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Even if grudgingly we're like, ah, oh, I don't like this person, they're so difficult to be around. Don't agree with them, don't want to have to listen to them. I always go off on a rant. You can find a way to love them. It's one of the things that separates us from the world. It's one of the things that signifies us as a believer is that instead of disassociating with them, instead of marginalizing and isolating from them, we actually try to connect no, they're not like us. He continues, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Our words can convey love, and that's a good start. But it has to then translate into action. You know, this has come out in pop culture where they say, I'm hurting, your thoughts and prayers are not enough. Don't say our thought, your thoughts and prayers are with me. Do something. Change the circumstance. Change the system. Now it almost is attracting lightning if you say our, my thoughts and prayers are with you because everybody knows it's just lip service. It's only in word, it's not in deed. Are you putting any money where your mouth is? You're actually trying to meet physical needs. John mentions this 2,000 years ago almost. It's not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Just like Jesus, John repeats his commandment. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom He has given us. It's kind of funny, in the evangelical realm, we oftentimes just reduce salvation to, well, if we believe in Jesus, then we know we'll be saved. But John adds something to this here. He equates loving one another with believing in the name of Jesus. Because he says, and this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. In some spheres, people like to get away with easy believism. I believe in Jesus and go on living my way of sin and not actually let his power transform the way that I think and live. I want to do my thing my way, live in destruction, and have a get-out-of-jail-free card at the end of life. But that's not really the salvation that the gospel preaches. It's a salvation or transformation. 
and as John says here, walks out in our day-to-day -day life by loving one another. You know, it wasn't just John who remembered this commandment of Jesus. It actually comes across from almost all the other New Testament writers as well. Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. We urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And I didn't even think while I was preparing to look up the words used for love there, because Greek has more words for love than we have for snow. We have lots of different frozen precipitation labels that we apply. And the Greeks use this with love. Chances are that brotherly love is one word for love. And later he goes on to use the agape version of love in this verse, which is even stronger. It's more self-sacrificial. Paul is commending the Thessalonians for the love they're showing for one another, and he urges them to do this more and more. And they were quite the ragtag group there in Thessalonica. There were former Jews that had converted to Christianity, weren't liked by the Jews who didn't convert Christianity or to it, and then there were just Greeks that the Jews never used to affiliate with, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, they're in the church. They're in my group now. And they were actually close to the Northlands, and so Scythians were a real phenomena around there. <laughs> it wasn't just a theoretically someone of another race might be in my presence. You know, it wasn't just conceptual. No, Scythians were in the neighborhood, loving one another. But they were all of a sudden this salad of mismatched vegetables thrown together. Or right next to each other. Do you know this is the first thought that Paul has six months later when he's writing to the Thessalonians again? In the next book he says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Paul is seeing this as mission success. Not only are they loving one another, but they're loving one another in an increasing fashion. And this is something that he and Silas and Timothy are giving thanks for. And he too, like John, sees not only are you walking in faith, which is good, you're also walking in love. Guess what Peter writes? Love one another. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again. Think about that. Because you've been born again, because you have believed in the name of Jesus, earnestly love one another. Again, it's not just lip service. It's from the heart. Sometimes love intrudes in our life. In this last May, my mother announced to my siblings and I that she was going to get remarried. And me and one of my sisters had seen this coming for a few months. Do you know that three of my sisters, not expecting this in any way, shape, or form, didn't interact with her quite enough to hear enough of the references to Fred Herzog and to realize she's going to Bible study with him and prayer with him twice a week and starting a church together. That's now four or five interactions in any given week. They had coffee together, what do you know? You just kind of pick up on these types of things and comments here and there. And I realized listening to my mother is kind of like listening to Annabelle sometimes. 
or Micaiah, like, hmm, something's happening. Three of my sisters were too engaged in other things in life to realize this was coming, and so my mother sends this email out, intending to get married to Fred, we're looking at dates in late June. <laughs> For three of my sisters, this was like smashing into a brick wall, like this was just absolutely terrible. And I found myself in a position of mediator amongst my siblings and my mother and my family, and I was like, okay. I'm sick with COVID presently. I have a soccer tournament coming up in three weeks. The kids are all finishing up school. That is an enormous transition. I'm coaching a team, pastoring a church. We're in theory going on a vacation we need to be preparing for. Now we're producing a wedding. And in the midst of this, I'm trying to keep everyone on talking terms with each other and helping three of my sisters get brought up to speed. You've been missing some things for the last few months. and. Remember in March when I warned you this could happen, you should be ready. Earliest possibility is June. I warned them. I really did. You know, there was a lot of conversations. I remember saying to Jen one night, in the last 24 hours, I have spoken with all four of my sisters and my mother on the phone and had numerous text conversations. I've never done that in my entire life since moving out of the house. That was a sacrifice of time. I had other priorities. I was sick with COVID for a week and a half of that as well, actually. And our house had been dinged up with hail and I had a contractor I was trying to manage. And there was no shortage of things that wanted to intrude in life. I recognized love and my position in the family at the moment is gonna require me to sacrifice some things here. See, sometimes love doesn't say, well, that's a big challenge, I hope you figure it out. Sometimes love is, all right, let's sit down and talk through this and figure this out together. Even though you've got something on your back burner that you were intending to do. Loving one another, I find, often intrudes on my priorities. Learned I need to schedule my life a little less intense so that I have margin to do what I'm hoping to do and also love other people. It can be incredibly inconvenient. It's the earnestness. So, you know, Peter repeats this at the end of his letter here, too, but he connects it to something else. He says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And he says, the end of all things is near. That was a while ago, so it must be closer yet. It says, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. These are good things. We want to live self-controlled lives because when we don't have self-control, we find we tend to, tar tend to start sinning and letting our <coughs> corrupt fleshly desires dictate our actions. We need to be sober-minded. But he says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. See, love doesn't fail to forgive. Love doesn't stay impatient. Paul even wrote a chapter about this. All the things love does and does not do. And Peter's just kind of like, if you love one another, that, that takes care of an awful lot of sin opportunities. If you love somebody, you won't be impatient with them. If you love them, you're not going to walk in unforgiveness. If you love them, you're not going to fail to meet their needs when they've got something that you can meet. It covers a multitude of sins. But he says this, because the end of all things is at hand. 
Do you know, Peter isn't the only one that connects loving one another to the end of the age. The writer of Hebrews. Might have been Paul. Recently, I've been leaning towards Barnabas, actually, as being the author of the book of Hebrews. It's been a 2,000-year debate. Somebody wrote it and didn't put his name on it, and we still argue over it. Paul write it, Barnabas write it, new angles, new insights. Whoever wrote it, he said, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more so as you see the day drawing near. Back then, they saw the day, the day of the Lord, drawing near. So that we have to keep gathering together with each other so that we can encourage one another, but also stir up one another to love. You know, sometimes I have to correct my children because they stir one another up to anger and frustration and to hate. There are some children that just walk into the room and can stir up somebody by their mere presence. And I'll speak to them and be like, so why is it that you standing next to your sister causes her to react this way? What have you done in the past that is causing her to squeal and protest your presence next to her? <laughs> this isn't the way we're supposed to stir one another up. Ideally, in the kingdom, when we gather together, we actually stir each other up to more good works, to more love. This is one of the reasons why we have share time and testimonies, not just so we can talk about all the diseases and ailments that are afflicting us and those we love, so we can pray for them, which is one of the ways we love one another, but also so that we can share the ways that we have been able to love one another and show the love of God in our community during the week. So we can stir one another up to do more of the same. And you know, when we neglect meeting together, we miss that encouragement. Our fire grows a little duller, and our zeal is a little bit more diminished, and we just don't have the same fervor. Because just like coals need to stay together in a fire to keep it hot, believers need to stick together in the church to keep zealous and fervent. So two of these writers have talked about how we need to love one another because the end is drawing near. Jesus actually spoke about the end, one of the signs to look for. It says, then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Loving one another is the antidote to this. If we're loving one another, we're not betraying each other, and we're not hating one another. And if we're gathering together to stir each other up, our love should not grow cold. But this is a sign of the end. The love of many grows cold, and they leave those who are close to them, those who are like them, whatever consequences may arise instead of meeting their needs they'll betray and hate one another in our country this isn't something we have to be concerned about too badly Did you know in Iran when a new believer joins the church it's a risk to love them because they may be a government spy who is just trying to infiltrate your group to turn you all in Do you know what? They still love one another. This is amazing testimony. Church in China has a lot of government surveillance. They have voice recognition software so that whenever these church leaders are talking on any cell phone anywhere in the country, 
Peter is going to pick it up, identify it, and they can just listen in on their conversations. So the agent who was assigned to listening in on these guys, because the church in China, the underground church, is very threatening to the Chinese Communist Party because they're so influential. This guy listened in on so many of their conversations. You know what they were talking about? They didn't talk about how awful the Chinese Communist Party was. They didn't say a single bad thing about the leader of China, C or Chi. They didn't say a single bad thing about any of the local political leaders. As they were talking on the phone, they were praying for their leaders. They were praying for the Chinese Communist Party that it could lead the country well. They were praying for each other. They were talking about the gospel. And the agent who was assigned to su or, uh, surveil them listened to this so much, he got saved and he joined their church. <laughs> because he, these leaders just had so much love coming out of them and coming out in their conversations. And it wasn't just about each other, but it was about the people who were trying to surveil them and to persecute them. See, that is how others will know that we're Jesus' disciples. By our love for one another. It stands out in a day and age where we're always trying to peg us with a certain identity so that we can be an us and them. And there's so many forces trying to divide us. Let us be different. Let us love one another with open arms. Let us welcome those who are not like us with open arms, seeking to meet their needs instead of saying, now you have to just become like us and then we'll be like you. Well, then we'll like you. Because Jesus' command was a self-sacrificial love. A love that costs us something. A love that's unconditional. A love that's rather expansive. But it's a love that Jesus himself displayed on the cross. We remembered and celebrated this morning. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this command to love one another that sets us apart from the rest of the world. And Lord, as we are children of the light, we pray that you would help us to embrace this command more and more. Even as Paul urged the Thessalonians, we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be able to grow in loving one another more and more. That it would not be something that is just lip service, but that we would begin designing our lives and our priorities around it that we would be willing to sacrifice our priorities to be able to love someone else, that we would be willing to lay down our preferences and be uncomfortable in order to love someone else. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be known by our love for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Holy Spirit remind you and bring to mind command to love one another as you walk through your week this week.